Hello, Year 10. This is the second lesson on anti-Semitism. You will notice it looks suspiciously like the first lesson on anti-Semitism in that I'm going to babble a bit at the beginning. Mind you, I do that with every lesson. Anyway, uh, welcome to the next lesson. You will have had from the last lesson a series of big numbers, which, because I'm me, I made literally big and put them on one slide each. So if you printed them out, they would fill up a page because then they'd be big numbers. I am that sad. Um, in the lesson, of course, they'd be on blue card, because of course they'd be on blue card. Well, I suppose they could be on pink. Yeah. Uh, for this lesson, I'm going to go through those answers. I said that you would be unsatisfied because I wasn't going to give you answers in the last lesson. So here they are. Let's see how you did. Um, the first number I'm going to share with you is the number 150,000. That's our first one. What did you think 150,000 was? Oh, interesting, interesting. I'm going to pretend like I can hear you. Oh, that's another interesting point. They're very different. Okay, it was in fact 150,000 mentally ill people given mercy killings. They were euthanized. 150,000 people were killed because their quality of life was considered so awful that they couldn't be given a good quality of life. And therefore, it made sense to kill them apparently, according to the Nazis. Next big number, it was under Aktion T4. Would it be T4 in German? T4. Uh, the next number is 300,000. Good answer. This is the number of hereditary ill people who were forcibly sterilized so they couldn't have children of their own and pass on whatever it was that made them ill because it was hereditary. I don't know what you think about this one, but I think the idea of removing people's choice against their will, I don't like. I mean, sure, you might say, well, it's a good idea because then people in the next generation aren't made ill, but that really ought to be the choice of the hereditary ill people, surely. And what if they don't know? You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, forcible sterilization, I'm always against. 120, one of the smaller numbers. Any idea what it refers to? I won't keep doing the joke. Uh, this is petty, that is small, it's from the French petite. Uh, Anti-Semitic laws passed after 1935, the first anti-Semitic law, the Nuremberg law. The Nuremberg law, simply put, said that Jews were not citizens. They were not um, allowed the same legal protections as other German citizens, because they didn't count. There were 120 more petty laws passed after that. And there were things like you're not allowed to sit in benches on parks, uh, in parks rather, or use the tram in Berlin. They are literally ridiculous laws to make life more difficult. They are vindictive, they are nasty, they are spiteful, and that's all they're there for, really. Another big number, 450,000. That's a big number. What is it referring to? This refers to the number of Jews forced into the Warsaw Ghetto. Damn it, this is an old version of the lesson. That should read uh, about the same size as Milford, because it is. Um, that's Menston, it's a place near where I used to teach. I am sorry, I thought I'd checked that. Never mind. You get a feel for the size of the ghetto. It's not very big, is my point. 1.5 million. There should be two of these, I said in the last lesson. So what are they? The first one is the number of under 12s killed in the death camps after 1942 and before 1945. 1 1.5 million of them, under 12s. That's people younger than go to school. Proper children, I guess. The other 1.5 million figure is the number of gypsies, Romanies, homosexuals, asexuals, and alcoholics who were also exterminated alongside the Jews. So it's, it's a big number, is my point. The biggest number, six million. That's the number of Jews who are exterminated. These are big numbers. These are terrible numbers. I'm going to go through a series of notes now. On the resources, you will have found a sheet to fill in, a bit like all of these, and if that helps, do use it. If you prefer to go through as they turn up on the screen, that's also fine. I'm not going to judge anybody for doing either or or both. Back to Julia Stryker in the background now. Um, oh, flip. No, I don't need to do that. No, don't do that. Hang on. I'm going to pause.
Sorry about that. I thought I deleted the slide and I hadn't. I do apologise. That's why the Menston thing turned up, isn't it? So I'm going to start with a bit of a timeline. Here is a timeline. You can write this down in your own words if you like. I think I've got it coming up anyway. Uh, intolerance in Nazi Germany, changing policies. In April 1933, you've got the SA organising the shops boycott. You may remember I referred to that in the last lesson. In September 1935, you've got sort of referred to as the Reich Citizenship Law, that Jews were no longer citizens. It's often called the Nuremberg Law because it was announced as a Nuremberg rally. If you've watched those in, uh, speeches from, um, what did I call it, uh, Triumph of the Will, then you've seen a Nuremberg rally. In 1937, the deportation of Jews was accelerated. That is, getting them out of the country and going to live in other countries. And as previously discussed, a lot of the countries they went to ended up being conquered by the Nazis not long afterwards. In November 1938, there was Kristallnacht. 20,000 Jews, not 100,000, I got that wrong, were sent to the camps. In 1939, Jews were forbidden to attend school. I mean, you look at those Jews, they're all idiots. None of them know anything. They're thick as pig shit. Oh, look, they're not allowed to attend school. 1939, Action TV against mentally ill begins. In 1940, Jews were forbidden to use benches in Berlin. In September 1941, Jews over the age of six were forced to wear the Star of David. Yeah, it's quite late on. In January 1942, there was something called the Van Zee Conference. And that was where the Nazis discussed the final solution to the Jewish problem in Europe. We know this as extermination and genocide. In 1943, Jews were forbidden to use trams in Germany. This seems like somewhat out of step. And the reason I include it is because it's a bit weird that the Jews are suddenly not allowed to use trams in Germany, having been uh, sent to death camps. It's almost like it's there solely to convince people in Germany that the Jews are still around and they're not being exterminated. And this is why you can't see them not allowed on the trams, you see. So, I don't know, is it good PR or is it just, sorry, I don't know what happened there, or is it just chaotic? Sorry, cut out mid-word. I'm having trouble with my tech, can you tell? So, on to the notes. Why did the Nazis persecute the Jews in Germany? Sorry, you might not be able to see the question marks, my face is in the way, but we'll deal with it. Here are some remarks made by Hitler to a journalist in 1922. He said, as soon as I have the power, I shall have gallows after gallows erected. Gallows are where you put the hangman's noose to exterminate, exterminate, execute people by hanging. Then the Jews will be hanged one after another, and they will stay hanging until they stink. They will stay hanging as long as it's hygienically possible. Uh, I think once a human body started to stink, it's no longer hygienically possible. As soon as they are untied, then the next groups will follow, and that will continue until the last Jew in Munich is exterminated. Exactly the same procedure will be followed in other cities until Germany is cleansed of the last Jew. I think we can safely draw from this that Hitler hated the Jews, and that Hitler had an idea that he wanted to exterminate them. Therefore, the Holocaust, I think, can be firmly laid at the feet of Hitler and the Nazis. To say that they didn't plan it, or to say that um, they made a hash of it, or even to say that plenty of other people had to be complicit. None of those things are lies, but I don't think they detract or take away from the fact that Hitler and the Nazis absolutely own this appalling chapter of human history beyond a shadow of a doubt. It is theirs. The blame and the responsibility lies with them, uh, just for the avoidance of doubt. Now I'm going to take away my face to get the rest of the notes up, because here they all are, all at once. I'm going to go through these a bit at a time. The point I'm going to make is that Hitler and anti-Semitism, the relationship between Hitler and anti-Semitism, uh, it is a long-held view. Here he is in 1922, that's 11 years before he's in power. But it's earlier than that even. In Vienna, we have the very first accounts of Hitler being anti-Semitic. It comes from another hobo, uh, uh, another tramp, because Hitler himself had no fixed abode and was living as a homeless man under several bridges. Uh, somebody met him, got his name, and recorded that they found him interesting, clown-like, because he heard the mayor of Vienna or whoever having a go at Jews, and there were plenty of people having a go at Jews in uh, Vienna at the time, and tried it on himself. He talked to other homeless people about the reason they were homeless was the Jews. The person who recorded this happened to be Jewish, and included the interesting footnote that they had always assumed Hitler was Jewish too. 
make of that what you will. Hitler is complaining to a Jew about the power of Jews. I'm not entirely sure Hitler knew what a Jew was, is my point. After the First World War, Hitler blamed the Jews for the defeat. He believed that the German army was on the cusp of victory. Now there's something to this. Adolf Hitler uh, was taken ill uh, by a gas attack right at the point when the Nazis, Nazis, the Nazis were in the First World War, when the Germans were at the height of their power in France. They, they, they were militarily at least about 50 kilometers from Paris. Uh, by the time he was well, this was a couple of months later, the Germans are losing the war badly, like really badly. They're on the cusp of invasion. But like many people, Hitler didn't know that or didn't want to believe it. Therefore, there had to be another reason why they lost the war. And that was easy. A lot of the socialist politicians were also kind of against anti-Semitism. And so some of them were Jewish and some of them were accused of being Jewish. It's therefore not that much of a step to blame Jewish politicians for ending the First World War when the socialists are the ones, the SDP are the ones that end up in charge. And most people wanted to believe that the SDP were Jewish and that they weren't properly German because anti-Semitism was a big deal and a lot of people were anti-Semitic at the time. They became scapegoats. That is, the Jews were blamed for everything that had gone wrong. Scapegoats, not escape goats. I once had a student who wrote escape goats. I'm not entirely what one of the, sure what one of those is. Maybe it's some kind of shaggy billy goat gruff with a huge handle on the side, pull in case of emergency. I don't know what an escape goat would be. Presumably it would save you from a mountain. I don't really, the, the noise there was pulling the handle. I'm sorry. Um, and so anti-Semitism, this hatred of the Jews, became a central Nazi policy and became everywhere in their propaganda. Do I have propaganda? I do. Here's that film poster, De Erwe Jude, a documentary film about world Judaism. Hmm, because apparently there is such a thing. There isn't. And apparently the Jews are out to destroy civilized society. They're not. Um, because, like all people, all Jews are different too. Funny that. It's like human beings don't operate by group. But the Nazis didn't just go after the Jews. The Nazis had it in for other, what they called asocials. And that is people that didn't fit in normal, inverted commas, society. People that didn't fit what the Nazis believed you ought to be. So one group of people that famously saw the bottom of the Nazi jackboot were the homosexuals because they could not breed. They could not have children. Not together anyway. Uh, girls having sex with girls or boys having sex with boys are not going to bring forth human progeny or indeed any kind of progeny. And so therefore they were against family values. Remember that? That empty term? You can pour whatever you like into it. In the camps they were forced to wear a pink triangle. That's it. Then they were murdered. Nice. Gypsies, gypsies, were also taken in because they were people of no state. They were stateless persons. They were Europe's last major nomadic tribe. And um, they were rounded up and they were murdered. Is it any wonder that the only place really in Europe where gypsies survived with their way of life intact, i.e. nomadic, not living in any particular area, is the United Kingdom. Think about that the next time you blame Chippos at a fair for, I don't know, whatever it is you want to blame them for. You're following in the footsteps of the Nazis when you do it. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Uh, the story goes that uh, wherever gypsies turn up, there's an increase in crime rates, but all of the studies show this is A, true, and B, down to people in the local area using the gypsies' presence as an excuse to carry out petty acts of vandalism and theft. Gypsies themselves, although there are many problems, and I'm sure there are, due to the facts of how they're treated, tend not to be implicated in the low-level stuff. They just don't. It's not a thing. There are tramps. They are homeless people that move from place to place. And they were rounded up and put in the concentration camps for hard labour. Many of them died. There are beggars. These are homeless people that don't go from place to place, but stay in the place wherever they were made destitute, I suppose. And they're also rounded up and taken to concentration camps where many of them will die. And there are alcoholics. Hitler had a particular hatred for alcoholics. People that drank too much and were addicted to alcohol ruined families. And they were rounded up and murdered. 
If you did watch the full two hour movie that I linked to sections of in previous lessons, Hitler, The Rise of Evil, yes, Kenzie, I'm looking at you, then you know that Hitler's dad was an alcoholic. Daddy issues. Um, there's also the sterilization of the tragedy and Aktion uh, T. Veer. Um, I've put Aktion Veer there because I forgot the T. Uh, here we have that math problem from earlier in the course. Uh, daily, it takes five and a half Reichsmarks to, uh, from the state to look after one mentally ill person, Um For five and a half Reichsmarks, you can look after an entire family for one day's life. So one person or one family. It's not really a math question, is it? And this convinced people that uh, euthanasia, deliberately killing those who were mentally ill, was a good idea uh, from an economic perspective. What did Nazi racial policies actually occur? Well, if you haven't written down the notes already, what did they achieve? Uh, here are the statistics, the awful numbers that we've already gone through, but just so you know. Uh, we've got 300,000 people with hereditary illnesses sterilized, 150,000 mentally ill given mercy killings or euthanized, 120 anti-Semitic laws after Nuremberg, 450,000 Jews living in the Warsaw Ghetto, 1.5 million under 12s dying, and 6 million Jews killed during the Holocaust. How do we get there? To get there, we go through those four stages I talked about earlier. And by earlier, I mean at the end of the last lesson. So let's start with identification. Jews were identified by the state. The Nazis decided who was Jewish and you were informed. If you're worried, you could send off for a test. These tests were not scientific. They included things like putting a pencil in the hair. Did the pencil fall out? Because apparently if your hair is too curly, that makes you Jewish. They included things like measuring the nose. I'm not sure, I've got a fairly large nose. Would I count as Jewish under Nazi law? I don't know. Also, measuring the eyes. These are not scientific approaches. They don't work. People whose eyes are too close together, in inverted commas, I don't think those people really exist. I'm just saying, and if they do, it's not a racial characteristic. Anyway, that's how they identified them. The state decided. After the civil service decree and the Nuremberg laws, it became important to identify these people. So one of the things you had to do was, if you looked a little bit Jewish, you had to go in for a test. Now, obviously this is racism, because if you don't look a little bit Jewish, you don't have to go in for a test, which meant that lots of actual genuine bona fide Jews were not picked up as Jewish because they didn't look Jewish enough, whatever that means. And I guess that left them with the inevitable thing of, do you stand with your fellows or do you not? Some people only found out later, just saying. It's bad science, awful racist politics, and well, predictable. Um, hey ho. The next level is victimization, to humiliate the Jews, to make them victims and to make other people happy to deal with them as victims, to be mean, to be nasty. So the first thing you do is you ban them from jobs. Those Jews are always on benefits, never working hard like the rest of us. Well, if they're banned from jobs, I guess they have to be. The next thing, you ban them from public areas. Those Jews, never see them in a public area. What have they got to hide? Why are they not in the parks or the shopping centres? Because they're not allowed. Then you ban them from shops. Those Jews never buy from German people, always buy from other Jewish businesses. Look after their own, don't they? Well, yeah, because they're not allowed in shops, see? Then there was a law passed that all Jewish men had to have the first name Israel and all Jewish women had to have the first name Sarah. No, really, this was a genuine thing. I don't know, all those Jews can't tell them apart, can you? Shout Israel, you all come running. Perhaps unsurprisingly in this uh, background, 30% of Jews left Germany by 1941. What's surprising is that number is so low. And part of the reason is, although the Nazis wanted rid of the Jews, they were callous. All of this is ad hoc, it's unplanned, it's chaotic. They don't care. It's not that they're evil going for the, the Jews, it's that they are evil through the banality of it all, through just not caring. 
is now a good time to mention this. When I went to Auschwitz, there was um, a tour and the, sa the sauna, the sauna, where they were taken uh, for processing if they were well enough and weren't sent immediately to the death, cha death chambers and the gas chambers and then burned. Uh, they went and they had to be stripped naked to check they weren't hiding anything like children. Um, and they'd stand there for as long as the inspectors decided, which was approximately pff, however long it took them. And then they were taken down and shaved so that their hair could be taken off and used for other projects and tattooed with their number. Uh, these were done in, so there were two very small rooms, I guess you had to queue, um, and one person worked in each. So I guess it took a long time. And what struck me about this is you walk around, that there's a sort of a walk around that they had to do. They had to go and then to get washed, they had to hang in their clothes on one side, and then they had to wait until those clothes were dried before they could wear them on the other side, which meant they didn't always get the same clothes they handed in. They got another bunch of clothes from the last group or the group that had just arrived, however the Nazis were running it that day. And then after that, they were registered um, with a name next to their number, which seems weird when you've been given a number, and then sent out of the camp except, uh, sorry, the sauna into the camp, except that none of that was particularly well planned. The rooms weren't set up properly. Uh, the building, purpose built as it was, wasn't built with this in mind. The, the room for the tattooing, for instance, was an old cupboard. It wasn't supposed to be a tattooing parlor. Why do I share this? Because it proves something about the way the Nazis ran this. They didn't care. They literally didn't care. It's not like they've got this idea that they're going to exterminate the Jews, they're going to do as efficiently as possible. Far from it. They literally don't care. And so everything is just thrown together at the last minute, and then it's run until something better comes along. And sometimes even then, they carry on running it the way they are because that's just the way it's done. The point I'm making is that we should not overestimate what the Nazis were doing. And that makes it all the more chilling. Their, their lack of caring their indifference is what the real evil is. The opposite of love is not hate. Hate implies some kind of passion, some kind of feeling. The opposite of love is indifference, the absence of feeling, the absence of care of any kind. Um, I think that's worth sharing at this point. It's, it's particularly horrid. So we come back to this. Oh, um, they want them to leave. And the reason they couldn't uh, was because all the different areas you had to go to to get the various papers and the various permissions in place were all in different parts of Berlin. And so it took really long time to do that until one uh, Nazi civil servant said, why don't we just put all the things in the same room? Um, it gets rewarded for this. And sure enough, the number of uh, people trying to leave to emigrate from Germany increases. Uh, does he save lives? I guess he does. The next stage is hostility to encourage violent action against the Jews. The most famous of this is Kristallnacht, the 10th to the 11th of November, 1938, where the Jews were fined for the damage because they had caused it by being too insular and not German enough. In Poland, it went a stage further. The Nazis there did not care about the Polish. They did not care about Poland as a country. And so the Nazis were free to recreate Poland however they wished. And the first thing they did was force Jews into the smallest area of the city, like Warsaw, that they could find, and then fence it off, wall it off, and then restrict the amount of food that went in, and to make the Jews pay for everything at inflated rates. And that was very deliberate. The idea was that the Jews, well, they didn't care. It's utter, utter indifference. They can die of starvation or not. The Nazis do not care. It's from there, by the way, that you end up with one of the largest uprisings. The Warsaw Uprising starts in the Warsaw Ghetto. Those that are left. How? I don't know. Special action groups, the Einsatzgruppen. They stalked behind the German army as they advanced, the Wehrmacht, and they exterminated entire villages of people, especially the Jews. I was going to tell you about my Uncle Mike not my real uncle, and some things that he said, but a video is not the place for that, so I won't do it. Then we come to extermination. Why was there a final solution? If they're so indifferent, why bother killing them? And the answer is that 
Well, by 1942, at the Wannsee Conference, there are millions of Jews under Nazi control, and the Nazis can't get rid of them. They're at war. They're too busy fighting to get rid of them themselves, and the fighting means the Jews can't leave themselves. They can't cross the front line. Um, it's too dangerous. So, of course, they can't. They're trapped, and the Nazis can't get rid of them. I mean, they had a plan to move them all to Madagascar, but Madagascar happened to be owned by the French. So that's not really a thing. Furthermore, if you want to carry out something awful, then wartime is a good time to do it because people are looking elsewhere for their own survival and they will just not look at things. And if they do know about it, they'll ignore it. And if they can't ignore it, they'll come up with crazy ideas to deal with it. Like the church in Germany that used to hold choir practice when the trains passed to the concentration camps so that they could drown out the sounds of the moaning and the screams from the trains. The death camps themselves were set up outside of the boundaries of Germany. They were set up in what is now Poland. Does that make them Polish? I don't think anyone says that, apart from the weirdly right wing Polish government who keep claiming they're not Polish death camps. Yeah, we know. They're Nazi death camps, they just happen to be in Poland. Holocaust deniers, I think I've said this before, say that you can't possibly murder this many people. There isn't enough evidence to say that this took place. And once, I think I've said this earlier before, but if I have, if I have, forgive me, I'm going to repeat it. Uh, I decided to take them at their own game. I took their maths. I read several websites and watched several YouTube videos and they were all using the same arguments. I thought, all right, fine. I'm going to take you at your maths. You say six million is too many. You say the reason is that the uh, poison gas chambers could only fit so many people in and to drag them out by hand would have taken so many hours and then to burn the bodies in the number of ovens available would have taken so long. So I took their figures. I did it entirely on their numbers. And they said there was only a run six days a week. They wouldn't have run on Sunday. So oh, I don't think the evidence is that, but okay, let's assume they run six days a week and they have one day off. And they said only run between these hours during daylight. Okay, I'll take them at that word as well. And so I worked it out. I like numbers, you know I like numbers. Um, and I worked it out by the number of death chambers solely at Auschwitz-Birkenau. I didn't include any other death camp, just Auschwitz-Birkenau. Uh, it's 42 separate camps, but there are only six major gas chambers only. And so I went, well, okay, well, I'll, 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 take, I'll, I'll make it even smaller just for you. Let's see how many, according to you, could have been killed in those gas chambers between the years of 1942 and 1945, running six days a week and not during major holidays or bank holidays, uh, and only during daylight hours. According to the Nazi Holocaust deniers, it's a, the Holocaust deniers, according to their numbers, it's seven and a half million. Oh, so 6 million Jews plus 1.5 million other executed and killed. Oh, but that's only one camp and there are about six of them. So if anything, 7.5 million might be too small a number. They claimed it wouldn't add up to 6 million. So I don't know what that says about Holocaust deniers, apart from the fact they're rubbish at maths. Um, my point being, this is a pretty awful period. And... I don't know of any way of making it less awful. So what can we conclude from all of this? There is a gradual worsening of action over time. That identification, victimization, hostility, extermination, I said before, gets repeated with every major genocide. And it's not only the Jews that suffer this, but they suffer the most. Sorry, they just do. So when you say the Holocaust, that refers to the Jews only. It's a Jewish term. The Nazi extermination program, the final solution, can refer to a number of groups and should. But the Holocaust I, is a Jewish thing because it was carried out against Jews, defined by the state, not by them themselves. And so we come back to this source, except now I've called it source A. Now I said on the lesson before last that the last major assessment was the essay you did on occupation. This, therefore, will be something I did in lesson, but I wouldn't necessarily record the marks. 
I would ask you to try it out and then peer mark it. You'd mark the person next to you. And then we talk about how you use the mark scheme and how that works. This can't be done with the current circumstances. I can't ask you to mark each other's work. I'd love to, I'd love to find a way of doing that, but I don't think it's the right time. So it wouldn't count as an assessment. So I'm not lying when I said that the last one was an assessment. However, if you want to have a practice, I warmly encourage you to have a go, and I see no reason why you wouldn't have a go at this. And if you want to submit it, that's the bit that's different, I suppose. You don't have to submit this work. Though many of you have been submitting the optional work, and I do appreciate that. It's been great to read it and see how you've been improving and offer some feedback. Um, and because it's in Corona times, I've not been able to draw all over it in red pen. So I'm hoping my feedback has been more helpful, even if your parents think I'm cruel, Will. Um, and I'm sorry about that. So, what can an historian learn about the Nazi policy to the Jews from source A? And remember, you can infer from the content, but also from the provenance. It's an extract from a children's textbook in Nazi Germany in 1939. But sir, how do I infer from that? Oh gee, is the audience only children? Ah, and that's how you infer. And you can then use the content to back that up and to make a point about what the messages are and how it works and what it tells us about Nazi policy. Now this source uh, turned up in the old exams a lot. I think it turned up about five years out of eight. So it's clearly a source that the examiners love and they're referred to again and again when it comes to picture sources. So it's worth going over. Uh, the first time I did this source in a class and talked through it, um, I was like, oh, it's turned up in an exam once. It probably won't turn up again. And it turned up that year. Hooray! Maybe look really good. So here it is again. And um, well, you've already labeled it uh, really deeply. You know what this source represents and how it works. That question should not take you long. I reckon it'll be about two paragraphs maximum. And you can probably you know, push that out relatively quickly. Like I say, in a, a, a lesson, I'd probably give you 10 minutes on it, no longer because frankly, you know what you're doing by now. Um, at home, you take as long as you like. You don't have to submit it. I'd warmly recommend it, and I look forward to reading those of you that do, but you don't have to. So let's go back to what I was trying to do with these sessions. This is the second of two sessions. Let's see whether I've achieved what I set out to achieve. Let's see whether what I've talked about has in any way, shape or form made sense based on what I said I was going to do. And it's a while ago since I talked about this. I said, by the end of this session, you'll be able to explain why the Nazis persecuted the Jews in Germany. And I think I said, the Nazis decided they were too not German, they were too insular. They looked themselves too much, they were too different. Most of you, I said, will be able to link the Nazi persecution of Jews to source material from the time. And we went through a lot of source material. So I am hoping that whatever turns up, you'll be able to understand why the Nazis are putting it out there and what it means about their persecution. Are they hiding it? Are they trying to make Germans feel good about what they're doing? Or is it a case of, no, we're trying to on that road. Is it identification? Is it victimization? Is it hostility? Or is it full on extermination? You won't find much on full on extermination that's public. I said some of you will be able to contrast the importance of anti-Semitism with other aspects of Nazi ideology, such as war, the social revolution, the economy, etc. And you might have been thinking about that already. Oh, that's just the big numbers. So, do put in the comments if I have not achieved any of these points, or you think that I've said things that make no sense in relation to these points, a reminder about what I was trying to do. Um, any questions, um, if you're not in my classes, they will be forwarded on to me. Don't worry, um, your teachers will also know the answers. So maybe they won't be forwarded on to me. If you have been, thank you for watching. Keep your eyes peeled. We live in strange times. We're living in an era where people increasingly want to find the enemy to identify those to have a go at and they'll identify them by groups. Now, I should point out, as someone who's had a go at politicians, I'm identifying a group of politicians and I'm having a go at them. Does that make me the same as this? No, because I do not identify and then set those groups myself. They announce themselves, and also, I hope, I do try and keep it reasonably personal to those people that are genuinely responsible.
there is a difference. You need to learn what that difference is. If you say you don't know what the difference is, then I urge you to go back into this video and check again. The next time someone tries to identify a group and tell you that they are the enemy, and then tries to victimize that group, and then tries to get you to be hostile to that group, I want you to be on your guard. If nothing else, this lesson ought to teach you to be careful. Always be careful. I'm not telling you what to believe, I hope. Nor am I trying to say that you believe the wrong things, I hope. I'm just saying be careful. Especially in these days where more and more things are being banded around social media. In the wake of pubs being opened and odd advice being given. Be on the lookout because I think it's going to rise. Have a lovely day, Yotam. And um, I look forward to seeing some of you around, and maybe you'll see me too. Lessons from here on in will be extras. Uh, they'll hopefully be useful. Of course, I don't think I teach anything that won't be useful. Um, but this brings us, I think, to pretty much the end of the course. In September, we will review, we'll go over some things, and we'll also do some more assessment just to make sure you're all comfortable and up to speed and we'll fill in any blanks there but these lessons form I hope the end of the course for you and i hope it makes sense to you and with that i bring these lessons to an end thank you very much for joining us on this rather strange journey i hope you've enjoyed it as much as i have going through all these lessons and doing so remotely i've actually quite enjoyed making these videos um, I hope they've been useful to you um, and they've not been too annoying or too long. Sorry, Debbie. Um, so I'll end it here. Thank you very much.